Hello and welcome to another episode of Reading Together from Seaharp Press. I'm Eugene Lunning, co-founder of Seaharp, and today we'll be continuing not only C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, but actually continuing from the middle point, chapter 10 of book four of this great work. The title of this chapter is Nice People or New Men. And Lewis has been taking us through this picture of how our temperaments play into what we would call in a big word, sanctification. So he's been describing a woman with a difficult temperament and a man who has sort of an easygoing nature and the reality that both need to have their full nature opened out to God so that he can do all the work required, make, make them entirely new. That's where we've been. So we'll be diving a little bit right into the middle. The two people he's been describing are Miss Bates and Dick Firkin. Lewis goes on. Do not misunderstand me. Of course, God regards a nasty nature as a bad and deplorable thing. And, of course, he regards a nice nature as a good thing, good like bread or sunshine or water. But these are the good things which he gives and we receive. He created Dick's sound nerves and good digestion, and there is plenty more where that came from. It costs God nothing, so far as we know, to create nice things. But to convert rebellious wills cost his crucifixion. And because they are wills they can, in nice people, just as much as in nasty ones, refuse his request. And then, because that niceness in Dick was partly, merely, pardon me, pardon me, merely part of nature, it will all go to pieces in the end. Nature herself will all pass away. Natural causes come together in Dick to make a pleasant psychological pattern, just as they come together in a sunset to make a pleasant pattern of colors. Presently, for that is how nature works, they will fall apart again, and the pattern in both cases will disappear. Dick has had the chance to turn, or rather, to allow God to turn, that momentary pattern into the beauty of an eternal spirit, and he has not taken it. There is a paradox here. As long as Dick does not turn to God, he thinks his niceness is his own. And just as long as he thinks that, it is not his own. It is when Dick realizes that his niceness is not his own, but a gift from God, and when he offers it back to God, it is just then that it begins to be really his own. For now, Dick is beginning to take a share in his own creation. The only things we can keep are the things we freely give to God. What we try to keep for ourselves is just what we are sure to lose. And I think here we're getting at that Pauline theology of being living sacrifices. You and I, we know it, are inherently selfish. That's one of the great fallouts of the fall. So we think that we can sort of possess ourselves, possess our things, that we can go through life and be to a degree unbothered by the way and the will of God. But what Lewis wants us to understand is that those things we offer to God are actually consecrated. They are made more holy, like unto God. And then it's as if God hands them back to us, and guess what? That's when we begin to possess them. So it's for us, first and foremost, to give over ourselves. Again, living sacrifices. Here I am, I lay myself out, and I would be like a dead man before you, God. He sees us, he has redeemed us by his crucifixion, and it's like he hands us back ourselves. But now we have been remade like unto him. Frankly, friends, it's the same thing for everything. It's the way we give over a day. It's the way we give over our possessions. It's even the way we give over those we love, our families. As we hand them to God and we say, make them yours, it's truly like he hands them back to us. And you know what we then possess? Gratitude. Awareness of our smallness in his presence. And then life takes on this robust meaning because it's a gift. It's from him and it's between him and us. 
So pay attention in your own life to the degree to which you try to hold things and think about the degree to which they could be handed off and then accepted back. This is a beautiful continuum of the eternal way of life. Let's come into it. I'll keep reading. We must, therefore, not be surprised if we find among the Christians some people who are still nasty. There is even, when you come to think it over, a reason why nasty people might be expected to turn to Christ in greater number than nice ones. That was what people objected to about Christ during his life on earth. He seemed to attract such awful people. That is what people still object to and always will. Do you not see why? Christ said, Blessed are the poor, and how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom, and no doubt he primarily meant the economically rich and economically poor. But do not his words also apply to another kind of riches and poverty? One of the dangers of having a lot of money is that you may be quite satisfied with the kinds of happiness money can give and so fail to realize your need for God. If everything seems to come simply by signing checks, you may forget that you are at every moment totally dependent on God. Now, quite plainly, natural gifts carry with them a similar danger. If you have sound nerves and intelligence and health and popularity and a good upbringing, you are likely to be quite satisfied with your character as it is. Why drag God into it, you may ask? A certain level of good conduct comes fairly easily to you. You are not one of those wretched creatures who are always being tripped up by sex or dipsomania or nervousness or bad temper. Everyone says you are a nice chap, and between ourselves, you agree with them. You are quite likely to believe that all this niceness is your own doing, and you may easily not feel the need for any better kind of goodness. Often people who have all these natural kinds of goodness cannot be brought to recognize their need for Christ at all until one day the natural goodness lets them down and their self-satisfaction is shattered. In other words, it is hard for those who are rich in this sense to enter the kingdom. And here I am sitting in a comfortable study in a comfortable and beautiful state of a comfortable country, the United States of America, of a comfortable worldview, let's call it the Western worldview. And so there is not as much friction in my life with reference to the kingdom of heaven as there might be for someone who is not within all of these things, all of these constructs. I wonder if you feel the same way. Sometimes the things that we find to be so difficult about following Jesus are absolute trifles with reference to everyone else. And so we can get so bogged down in our comfort, in our relative richness, that we do not pay attention to that way that is straight and narrow, that at times is difficult, that is actually like a yoke. It's work. And yes, it's a light and easy yoke because he's doing all the work, but friends, sometimes we're not even paying attention to being under it in the first place. So for you and for me, I offer you the challenge of paying attention to the way that our comforts get in the way of our discipleship, of the fact that it is hard for those who are rich, and you and I, friend, we are rich, to actually come into and to possess the kingdom of heaven. It is difficult because we make it difficult. I'll keep reading. It is very different for the nasty people, the little, low, timid, warped, thin-blooded, lonely people, or the passionate, sensual, unbalanced people. If they make any attempt at goodness at all, they learn in double-quick time that they need help. It is Christ or nothing for them. It is taking up the cross and following or else despair. They are the lost sheep. He came specially to find them. They are, in one very real and terrible sense, the poor. He blessed them. They are the 
awful set he goes about with. And of course, the Pharisees say still, as they said from the first, if there were anything in Christianity, those people would not be Christians. There is either a warning or an encouragement here for every one of us. If you are a nice person, if virtue comes easily to you, beware. Much is expected from those to whom much is given. If you mistake for your own merits what are really God's gifts to you through nature, and if you are, cons if you are contented with simply being nice, you are still a rebel. And all those gifts will only make your fall more terrible, your corruption more complicated, your bad example more disastrous. The devil was an archangel once. His natural gifts were as far above yours as yours are above those of a chimpanzee. But if you are a poor creature, poisoned by a wretched upbringing in some house full of vulgar jealousies and senseless quarrels, saddled by no choice of your own with some loathsome sexual perversion, nagged day in, day in and day out by an inferiority complex that makes you snap at your best friends, do not despair. He knows all about it. You are one of the poor whom he blessed. He knows what a wretched machine you are trying to drive. Keep on. Do what you can. One day, perhaps in another world, but perhaps far sooner than that, he will fling it on the scrap heap and give you a new one. And then you may astonish us all, not least yourself, for you have learned your driving in a hard school. Some of the last will be first, and some of the first will be last. And just to get a little philosophical and still theological here with you, one of the reasons, and maybe you've read them, maybe you haven't, that I personally enjoy the writings of Soren Kierkegaard, who wrote in the midst of what he called Christendom, which was sort of his epithet for cultural Christianity that really meant nothing to people's hearts, is that Kierkegaard said, when we fall into the first camp here, we're just, it goes well. We're just sort of nice Christian people. We don't take it to head or to heart very much. Well, then we can float along through life and find at the end that we will take some very hard falls. Whereas, if we look at our own individual self and realize that this is the place for which Christ came and died, then we will be like that prayer in the temple. Not the Pharisee, but the one who beat his breast and said, Lord, take mercy on me. I'm just a sinner. Friends, even if your life has been easy, you have every need of a complete repentance. I do too. Every day we need to wake up and to be reminded that we are the least of these, that we are sinners of a great sort, and that Jesus, seeing all that, loves us regardless. But he then calls us to actually follow him, to really repent, and to be set free. Just this morning, I was reading in John chapter 18, 19, I think it was 19. It's the moment of the cross when Jesus actually shouts out, it is finished. And I was reminded all over again, I wrote in my journal this morning, it is finished. I am free. Now I need to live free. That is the call for both of us, to be and to live free to not just go through the motions of our Christendom, but to be individual standing before the throne of grace and to personally receive that grace. I'll keep reading. Niceness, wholesome, integrated personality, is an excellent thing. We must try by every medical, educational, economic, and political means in our power to produce a world where as many people as possible grow up Nice. Just as we must try to produce a world where all have plenty to eat. But we must not suppose that even if we succeeded in making everyone nice, we should have saved their souls. A world of nice people, content in their own niceness, looking no further, turned away from God, would be just as desperately in need of salvation as a miserable world and might even be more difficult to save. 
for mere improvement is not redemption. Though redemption always improves people, even here and now, and will, in the end, improve them to a degree we cannot yet imagine. God became man to turn creatures into sons. Not simply to produce better men of the old kind, but to produce a new kind of man. It is not like teaching a horse to jump better and better, but like turning a horse into a winged creature. Of course, once it has got its wings, it will soar over fences, which could never have been jumped, and thus beat the natural horse at its own game. But there may be a period, while the wings are just beginning to grow, when it cannot do so. And at that stage, the lumps on the shoulders, no one could tell by looking at them that they are going to be wings, may even give it an awkward appearance. And I love this picture here simply because you and I are people in transition. We have been justified. We are being sanctified. We are not as we will be, and we are certainly not as we will be when we stand before him after we go to the other side of this. But I love these lines. They are so profound when it says, God became man to turn creatures into sons not simply to produce better men of the old kind, but to produce a new kind of man. I want to remind you, as I often do, that today is the playing field for this exercise, for this transition from what you were to what you are becoming. And friends, we need to be wide awake to this. This is the most important thing that's happening in our lives right now. The call of Jesus to us individually and our individual response to it today. I often point you back to the Sermon on the Mount. Go there. Pay attention to what it's like to be a citizen of heaven and then live likewise. Not perfectly, but incrementally, yes. You can be more like Jesus today than you were yesterday because it's him who is making it so. All right, last paragraph, and we will finish this, chapter 10. But perhaps we have already spent too long on this question. If what you want is an argument against Christianity, and I well remember how eagerly I looked for such arguments when I began to be afraid it was true, you can easily find some stupid and unsatisfactory Christian and say, so there's your boasted new man. Give me the old kind. But if, once you have begun to see that Christianity is on other grounds probable, you will know in your heart that this is only evading the issue. What can you ever really know of other people's souls, of their temptations, their opportunities, their struggles? One soul in the whole creation you do know, and it is the only one whose fate is placed in your hands. If there is a God, you are, in a sense, alone with him. You cannot put him off with speculations about your next-door neighbors or memories of what you have read in books. What will all that chatter and hearsay count? Will you even be able to remember it when the anesthetic fog, which we call nature or the real world, fades away and the presence in which you have always stood becomes palpable, immediate, and unavoidable? This past weekend, my lovely wife, Jenny, and I had a great getaway up in the mountains. And driving home, I was sharing with her a quotation that I had been reading the day before. And it comes from one of my favorites, good old Leo Tolstoy. And to paraphrase what he said, the permanent revolution of the inner life that we're looking for begins right here. I can sense it. For you, you can sense what the Lord is trying to do. But we trifle away our days in looking at our neighbor, in looking even at all of humanity and saying, oh, too bad. They're going to hell in a handbasket. It's just not working out for them. While all along, that voice from within calls out for, again, a permanent revolution. So friends, the Lord Jesus has thought it absolutely worth his time, 
his full attention and his life to come and to make you into his friend, his disciple, and finally, his younger brother, part of the family of God. Your opportunity to respond to that invitation is, again, called today. Let's not think about our neighbors. Let's not think about that worst sinner we know that we can compare ourselves to and feel better. It's between you and your God. Today is the time to respond, to obey, to live according to those lights that he has shown you. Let's do it. Let's live it. Let's be fully alive in his presence and let's show the world that he is a good God. Thanks for joining me. That was part two of chapter 10 of book four in C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. It has given me plenty to think about for the rest of my day and I hope it's the same for you. And as always, I'll say, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.